Today on CityCast Denver, after months of anticipation, the Michelin Guide has finally announced which Colorado restaurants are worthy of a prestigious Michelin star. So we're dishing on the five winners, the many snubs, and a revealing new report exposing what a Michelin star really costs. Plus, all the other food news you need to know, and the coolest events happening this weekend. Today is Thursday, September 14th. I'm Paul Caroli, in for Bree Davies, and here's what Denver's talking about. All right, here we are. Welcome, everybody. I'm here with producer Olivia Jewel Love. Hey, Paul. And because it's Thursday, it's time to talk about the latest food and dining news. Uh, our newsletter editor and resident foodie, Peyton Garcia, is here. Hey, Peyton. Hey, guys. All right, you two. We have the the biggest food news of the year, perhaps, in Denver yeah, to talk about so. today. It is so exciting that we finally have the winners of Colorado's first Michelin stars, the prestigious tire company has deigned to give some of our restaurants their special stars. Peyton, tell us about it. What's happening? Yeah. So it was announced on Tuesday night at a big ceremony. Um, The Colorado restaurants that now have Michelin stars, they picked five. One is in Aspen, one is in Boulder, and three are in Denver. And everybody got one star. There was so you can get up to three stars. Three stars is like super insane, the best, the highest you can get mm-hmm. to. And and the way they described it originally in their guides was one star is worth a stop, two stars is worth a detour, three stars is worth a journey. Right. Right. So these are I mean, it's a tire company. <laughs> Again. These yes. are road guides. That's the whole history of this thing. But we're going to get into more of the um, the, the context behind this. Peyton, you're, you're, you're not telling us the restaurants. I got to yeah. hear. What yes. are the, who, who, who wins? Who won? So the one um, in Aspen is called Bosk. I know nothing about it. Oh. B-O-S-Q. I had never heard of it until last night. Also a note on the ceremony, the most boring ceremony. Did either of you watch this stream at all? No. Oh, it was awful. No. It was so awful. It was like an award show. They had two people up on stage, but then I don't know where the restaurateurs were sitting. It was like miles away because they would announce it and then just like sort of wait and awkwardly watch and there's no music. So you're just watching a live stream of people walk up to the stage. Terrible. Terrible. Uh, anyway, Bosk and Aspen wow. wins one. Okay, one star. I, I'm also it's blind great. reacting right now. This is, I, I haven't even read the list, so. In Boulder, to nobody's surprise, Frasca Food and Wine. A mainstay, a classic. Okay, yeah. I think that was yeah. expected. Okay. Mm-hmm, absolutely. And then the three in Denver are Beckon, Bruto, and Wolf's Taylor. Mean anything to you guys? I mean, yeah. <laughs> Olivia, how about you? You been in any of these places? <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah, I would expect that most of our listeners had. This is like, these are super exclusive places. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I went to super... Frasca on my wedding night. It was a very special yeah. occasion. Aww. Yeah. These are these are high levels. So they say, you know, the Michelin's all about like, it doesn't have to be fine dining. You don't have to be fine dining to, to deserve a star. You don't have to be super exclusive, but you kind of are. Yeah. So you go in and it's very private, a very exclusive experience. You're sitting at a really intimate chef's counter that only seats you know like 12 to 18 people um and you're having a super intimate experience with the chef and the other diners and all of the food is super fine dining high quality it's got you know jellies and foams yes. and it was yeah. assembled with tweezers <laughs> exactly and all, exactly all of that something i found interesting though is bruto and wolf's mm-hmm. taylor are both kelly whitaker restaurants so he created both of them. And then Beckon was created by the by people who came from Frasca. Interesting. So there's this very small, tight-knit community of these super elite chefs yeah, and restaurant tours. I kind of felt that way. And then, I w- well, I was just going to say, and then they gave out Green Star Awards, which is their sustainability awards. Um, and Bruto and Wolf's Taylor both got those awards. Hmm. Okay. Well, hmm. what did I see? Because I got I got excited about a place I've never been, but wanted to go. I thought I saw something that Olivia's was going to win something. Um, yeah. So they so Olivia didn't win anything, but they were listed on the Michelin 
recommended list. Ugh. So, or maybe, yeah, Michelin recommended. And so a whole bunch of restaurants got listed on there. Okay. Um, and most of them, you know, I think it makes sense. You've got A5, Steakhouse, Barolo, uh, Deshaun B. T. House, Garden Grace, Mercantile. Oh, Deshaun B. T. House? That's nice. Mm-hmm. Oh, I like Mercantile. Oak at 14th. All of these places. The one that really surprised me, though, mm-hmm. and I, I swear to God, I thought it was a typo, Marco's Coal Fired. Oh, boy. Marco's what? Coal Fired Pizza? Yeah. That's an interesting restaurant. That's the only VPN certified restaurant in Denver, I think in all of Colorado. So they make their pizzas according to like the traditional Neapolitan tradition. Oh, that's why I I went there once, didn't have a great time. Didn't have a great time. Hmm. I just like, I know I went there one time. very surprised to hear that. Like a long, 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 long time ago. And it was a pizza parlor. Like that's Mm -hmm. it. Yeah. It was not, it was nothing, nothing fancy. Not a standout. Interesting. But now that you bring up the VPN thing, that makes sense. That's that's absolutely why they're on the list. Yeah. Well, hmm. um, snubs, Peyton, and other snubs, Olivia, is there anything else, anything you think got snubbed here? <sighs> yeah. See, clearly I don't, I, I'm not in the fine dining world. I mean... I'm not in the fancy restaurant world. I was just excited because I thought I saw Olivia's. Haven't been there yet. Been wanting to go for obvious reasons. Great because name. it's named Olivia. Great name. <laughs> uh, no notes. <laughs> But um, mm-hmm. it looks kind of fancy, so um, <laughs> I I, I don't there. think so highly of myself to think that I have any kind of credibility to to say who deserves. I'll say Flagstaff in Boulder got snubbed, and I only say that because my friend is the one who owns it, and he was really hoping <laughs> he would get a star, but he didn't even get recognized. Who would you give your Peyton sad. star to? You would give, give them a Peyton star? My first thought goes to Sushi Den. Yeah, that's one I know people were talking about before the award yeah, ceremony, that they would they were possibly going to be up for one. Um, but uh, I think that qualifies as a snub for sure. Tavernetta is another one that I thought of. Oh, you know, it's the same people behind yeah. uh, Frasca and uh, that those other places you mentioned. Although Peyton, they so got a- could have uh, been in. They got Bib Gourmand. Oh, they have enough. Interesting. They're fine. So, so, but I, mean, I think doing great. that <laughs> there's there's more to talk about here, though, right, Paul? You there sure the is. New York Times came out came out with a story what yesterday, mm-hmm. and um, I don't know. It was kind of a bombshell. Do you want to oh, tell us a well, little about it? Yeah, I mean, it hit me like a sack of bricks because I like I listened to you all on the show a couple weeks ago. And like many of the chefs we've heard talk about these Michelin stars, was very excited that the Michelin company was coming to Colorado to give out their stars. It was like a recognition of our culinary scene. And it felt so validating um, for all the great meals that we've we've had and shared together. Uh, turns out that is like maybe 50 to 75 percent BS. Because according to the New York Times, the Michelin company has completely changed its uh, its like business organization in the last 15 years. Because like for 100 years, it was a tire company that published these very exclusive road guides for very specific places, like mostly Europe, um, awarding these places that became like legendary because they were so exclusive. Like not many people got Michelin stars. 15 years ago, the guides are losing money. So the Michelin company brings in this hotshot consulting company and they advise Michelin to, uh, to change, change the mission, change what you're doing. Um, so quoting from the New York Times, they say, soon the Michelin guide began to transform itself from an elite arm's length critic of the restaurant industry to a financial partner. And what that means is that they're taking money from tourism boards in various states to get them to come and eat at these restaurants. So that's what California did. Like 10 years ago, they paid $600,000 for the Michelin folks to come out. And according to this report, I haven't seen this reported anywhere else in the local media, which is shocking. But according to this report, the Colorado Tourism Board paid $100,000 per year over three years and then invited a bunch of other partners to come pitch in as well to, to get the Michelin inspectors to eat at certain restaurants. So that's why they only came to Denver and Boulder and Vail and Aspen is because mm-hmm. the people who pitched in are Visit Denver are some of the ski resort companies and, and they're like they're paying according to the new york times between seventy thousand and a hundred thousand dollars for michelin to come to denver so this is why 
uh, Annette, Caroline Glover, the mm-hmm. very well-respected chef in Annette, who had James been... James Beard Award winner. James Beard Award winner, one of our best, undoubtedly. She's obviously snubbed because mm-hmm. Aurora didn't pay to have the Michelin Guides come to Aurora. Same with Colorado Springs. Nothing in Colorado Springs was even considered because the Colorado Springs Tourism Board didn't pay up. Ugh, I hate this. The crazy thing, too, about that is like Aurora, well, Colorado Springs is the second biggest city in the state, right? So it's like yeah. you think that they should be considered. And then Aurora is like arguably the most diverse and, and like culturally and like it, they just have an incredible dining scene. And it, it does yeah. feel like a snub that nobody there is being considered. It's not even a snub. It's, it's just like you didn't buy it. You know, it's like you didn't pay for it. It's ridiculous. Oh, it makes me so mad. <laughs> it, it is maddening. I think it's important to dis- distinguish between who's paying for it because it's not the restaurants themselves no, no, that no, are no. paying for it, but it's the tourism boards who are saying, come here, take it, take a, take a bite. See if any of these places within our borders are worthy. So it totally undermines the meaning of the stars, in my opinion. Yes, but they'll say like, I mean, Michelin, the Michelin people maintain that just because they're going doesn't mean anybody's going to get a star and you still can't buy a star. So your restaurants still have to perform. Now, I get that that's still sucky because it's like we have so many restaurants, you know, like you said, Annette and Aurora that maybe should have qualified for one, but doesn't even get to get considered because Aurora didn't pay up. I don't know. I'm, I'm super torn because... I don't know. I don't know if it takes away the value of the star, but it does add some complexity to how I feel. I just truly don't understand why you have to pay to be even considered. Like, I get that you're not buying the star, but to, like, pay to play? Like, yeah. it's crazy. Well, it's, Michelin needs the money. That's what happened right. 15 years ago. They needed a new revenue stream. And so if they think of themselves as more of a partner to the industry and as less of a, a critic then they they can get some of that money. What happened to tires? Are they making them too well and they're not wearing out <laughs> fast enough? Like what? <laughs> like what's Who the knows? Deal? I have no idea. The um the other interesting thing, that New York Times piece was uh, just a fascinating read. So it goes into all of that, right? And then something that the, the part that I thought was most interesting was the chefs that were talking about the like toll that comes with getting a star. Yes. Um. On on because like as we know, the hospitality industry is already rife for you know mental health issues and substance abuse disorder. Um. But the 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 chefs in the story talk about how the pressure of trying to earn a star, and then once you get a star, the pressure of trying to keep that star is like so insane. It's just not worth it. There was they they talked about one chef that actually renounced his stars because he said he couldn't handle the pressure. And then there was in 2003, a French chef that commit suicide because he was afraid oh he was going to be demoted from two stars. You can get them taken away. You can get yeah. your stars taken away. Yeah. Oh you have God. to continue to maintain the, the level that the inspectors originally had when they, ah. yeah. Yes. That's so, so stressful. Yeah, oh I mean, stressful, God. but also, like, expensive. That's what that means. Like, you got to pay for more people, pay for more training, pay for better ingredients. They talked to a chef who had two stars, and she was saying that she doesn't think that she could get three stars because she can't afford the upgrades that it would require. More courses, matching uniforms, um, just all of that fanciness. She's like, I can't afford that, so I'll never get three stars. Hmm. It's just so curious, like how, how this company and the way it operates has created these incentives towards a similar kind of dining experience. That's like, doesn't really resonate with regular folks. Like Olivia was saying earlier, like I will never go to these restaurants. Right. It's maybe it's aspirational for a special occasion, like a wedding, but you're probably not going to go. And that was the other thing from the article that uh, jumped out at me was like the whole underlying reason for the Colorado tourism board to to make this investment in luring Michelin was because they have data that shows that international tourists to Colorado spend five times as much as domestic tourists. 
So it's much more valuable for them to try to attract mm -hmm. international tourists. And for a restaurant, like if you're trying to build a sustainable business, like you need a regular community and a restaurant is like inherently a local thing. So it's, I, I feel like it's just going to like further bisect some of these high end restaurants from, from the local community and like people that could be supporting them. Yeah. That's why I liked learning about the Bib Gourmand because I got to try a couple of them at the Denver Food and Wine Festival. Mm -hmm. And they were like so delicious. And those are places that I could actually like afford to go to and see myself going to. And it was like, cool, because I'm like, they're local. And, you know, I like the concept of you could get all this stuff without breaking the bank. That's the other thing that I think I I am I am such a mixed bag of emotions this morning because that's the other thing is then you're you look at it like that and you're like oh that's so cool that now they're also including these other restaurants on the recommended list and the Bib Gourmand list that are a little bit more approachable, but then the New York Times piece also talked about does that take away some of the prestige from the Michelin guide, like, cause then they started talking about how like, Perhaps. it's just all the same. Like now what anybody can get a Michelin guide, like a Michelin star or Michelin recognition. Like we're talking about Marco's coal fired pizza. Like they're Isn't, Michelin it's recognized. It's a little weird and not a net. Yes. And not totally. a net. Totally. So it's Marco's just, but not a net. Yeah, weird. Yeah. It's so weird. I will say this though, before we move on. I read for a long time and I was feeling very, very <laughs> confused about how I should feel. But the New York Times piece ended with a quote from a chef here in Denver, the chef of Misfit Snack Bar in Molotov, Bo Poritko, I think is how you say it. But his quote was, um, not a lot of chefs here really deserve it yet. Uh, but I hope it will push everyone to get better and be more adventurous. And that made me feel better. Well, that's a pretty nice place to end this conversation. There's obviously a lot more to talk about with this story. It's super interesting. We'll put a link to this New York Times piece we've been discussing in the show notes. But right now, we're going to take a quick break and come back with recommendations for your weekend. This episode is brought to you by Bad Boy Boards. From a studio apartment to a gourmet kitchen, they have a cutting board for every chef. Did you know that food prep is safer on wood than plastic? Bad Boy Boards are made from chef quality hardwoods in lots of eye-catching designs. You can even use their 3D board builder to customize your own. From cutting boards to board care products like wood wax and cutting board oil, all products are made on site with locally sourced materials. They even sew their own tote bags and are a proud employer of the local Colorado community. Check out their brand new brick and mortar location at 8200 South Park Circle in Littleton or order directly from badboyboards.com. That's badboyboards.com. Support for CityCast Denver comes from Thirst Colorado Magazine, which features exciting adventures, eclectic arts, and tasty food and craft beverages from all over Colorado. Consider Thirst Colorado your source for what to do, where to go, and the best places to eat and drink after your adventures. The current issue of Thirst Colorado dives deep on local wine, explores what to do around the real town of South Park, and so much more. Pick up a copy at your favorite brewery and other local establishments around Colorado or visit thirstcolorado.com. That's thirstcolorado.com. All right, and we're back. So, Peyton, we talked about the Michelin stars. Uh, normally, we do food news. And then the next piece is a little food question. Question for our listeners about what they're interested in eating. Yeah. What's, what's our question this week? <laughs> okay, my question to you guys is, would you hike four miles in the wilderness to eat Arby's? Absolutely not. Hmm, yeah, I mean... <laughs> No, but tell me more. Why Why is this coming up? This I is don't an need to know question. more. The answer is no. <laughs> hilarious to me. So Arby's is debuting as of this week on the 12th, or maybe it was the 11th. Um, they're debuting an elk and venison burger. Um, it's the second ever burger on their menu. And to debut it, they thought it would be fun <laughs> to host a pop-up restaurant at an undisclosed remote high elevation location in the mountains. 
And if you want to participate uh, in this little challenge, <laughs> you sign up on, or you think you actually have to go to Arby's to sign up. So you register at Arby's, it's free. And then they'll tell you where you're supposed to hike to. And then you make the four mile hike. And I can at least tell you that it's at least 10,000 feet in elevation. So you're hiking. And then when you get to the top, there's an Arby's and you get to try the burger for free. <laughs> um, uh, AKA there's a guy with a sack of burgers because he also just hiked up there that morning. God, I have so <laughs> many questions. I just, oh my God. I, I oh am boy. just so confused by this whole thing. Summit goals. But I can't say, I can't say my curiosity's not peaked. I mean, okay, as far as Arby's goes, I don't, I don't imagine they do a good burger. Um, so I'm not particularly interested in that. That said, you know, I don't hate Arby's roast beef sandwiches. You know, I'll eat that. But um, I, I, yeah, I don't know. The only thing that's selling me here is I'm looking at this Denver Post article. I like the rain jacket that the of course you do, Olivia. sponsored <laughs> post that they have. You it's, can get Arby's burger hike swag. I I don't know if you can or not. but You but, can. Oh, well, see, I, I would maybe do it for the rain jacket because it's not like super Arby's branded, it, but it's pretty cute. That's that's about it for me. Um, definitely not doing it for the Arby's. Imagine walking down, like hiking back. To, you got to hike back down. They're not carrying you. You got to hike <laughs> down after you eat that monstrosity. God, oh, Paul, what yeah. do you think about I don't, all this? I mean, I'm not a burger person. I'm not eating a lot of ground beef, not really eating a lot of meat. So this particular <laughs> exclusive stunt is not that appealing to me, but I do, um, I do kind of love it. Like if it was for some other kind of food or like I saw Upslope Brewing does one of yeah. these too. They have like a back backwoods tap room I and that, that sounds great that to sounds me. I would great. love to go hike for some exclusive limited release beer. Yeah, the I guess I that like. makes sense. Oh, yeah. I, it's the ex it's the exclusivity that is yeah. cool. I mean, Olivia is lured in by the swag. I am. But, I think uh, I think Paul should go do it. And once he gets up there, be like, oh, could I actually get the impossible burger? <laughs> do you have a vegetarian option? What's the vegetarian option? Be like, I thought this was at Arby's. Where's the other options? Can I see the menu? <laughs> I do like that. Like, would you like, I don't know. Like, you know how um, Stranahan's does like the snowflake whiskey? Mm -hmm. Like if it was that at the top of a mountain, I feel like I would want to hike it. Yeah, yeah that sounds fun. it's just so sounds random fun. that it's an Arby's. Like they know, were like, how so can weird. we be relevant? And then my question is, how many people are actually doing this? How that's what I want to know. How many people are so excited by by a new Arby's venison burger that they're that they're gonna sign up for this? It's all the dads. All the dads of Denver are banding together, putting on their chacos and hiking up hand in hand. <laughs> All right, listeners, if, if you are that Denver dad and you are excited about hiking for Arby's, uh, let us know. We want to hear from you. But if you're not, um, also, what would you hike four miles for an exclusive sneak peek of food-wise? Uh, call us. Let us know. Leave us a voicemail on the uh, Arby's Adventure hotline. That number is 720-500-5418. Again, the Arby's Adventure hotline is 720-500-5418. All right, here we are. The end of the Thursday show. You all know what we got to do. It's time for the official CityCast Denver, maybe for your weekend, as in maybe you'll see us there because as usual, there are so many cool things happening in Denver this weekend, but there's only one where you might see us. Peyton Garcia rounds up her best bets in our newsletter, Hey Denver, every week, and we're going to talk about them and pick our fave. So Peyton, what do you got for us this week? Sure, guys. Okay. So Friday the 15th, um, that kicks off Hispanic Heritage Month. Uh, oh, okay. And Stanley Marketplace is hosting a celebration um, in honor of that. So Friday from 5 to 9 p.m. in Aurora at Stanley Marketplace, uh, you can go watch Lucha Libre wrestling. There's going to be live mariachi. There's going to be folklorico dancing, bull riding, food, drinks, um, just all sorts of fun in honor of Hispanic Heritage Month. Okay. Real Very bulls. Cool. Real bulls? Not real bulls. Uh oh. Mechanical. Sorry, I guess I should specify. Mechanical bull riding. And I'll say Stanley Marketplace is a really cool place if you've never yeah. been there. It's fun. Yeah, you can go see the the restaurant that doesn't have a Michelin star. Exactly. In right in there. <laughs> exactly. Jeez. Maybe you could get um, a reservation. Um, there what you else go. you got, Peyton? Okay, so then Saturday, all day, uh, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., 
I want to go to the Mile High Flea Market. Have you guys <gasps> ever been there? No, but it sounds right up my alley. I know Is this the Brie one has. that's outside in Power Field? No, it's um out in Henderson. Tell me about it. Tell me everything. It's it's been going it's been happening for a long time. As long as I can remember. We used to go when I was a kid all the time. So I have all the nostalgia feels for the Mile High Flea Market, but it's, you know, like hundreds and hundreds of vendors um selling their wares. It's three dollars to get in, five dollars if you want a three day weekend pass. And kids under eight are free. And it's it's just hmm. such a, it's a fun, great time. I know Bree's probably been there. It's so, we used to go all the time as a kid. Um, and anyways, on top of it being the Mile High Flea Market, which in itself is awesome, they're having their Michelada Fest uh, oh. this weekend as well. So when you go in, uh, they're going to have some handcrafted Micheladas. And when you buy one, you get a swag bag with it. Wow. Yeah. Sounds- and if you don't know awesome. what a michelada is, it's basically like a Bloody Mary, but instead of vodka, you're putting beer in it. Yeah. So it's like beer, tomato juice, hot sauce. It's delicious and refreshing. Um, Sometimes and- a little chili, chili, yeah. uh, dried chili on the rim. Yeah. Some veggies. Sometimes. I've had a michelada or two in my day. Yeah. They're good. <laughs> I like them. Wow. Um, all right. Hit us with the next one, Peyton. Okay. Sand Creek Mural Festival. So I need to give you guys a little backstory Mm. for this one. In 2022, so just last year, the city finished paving the Sand Creek Greenway Trail. It's three miles of trail for biking, jogging, walking. Um, And they've been painting murals along the trail. They painted the original one in 2020. They had another one commissioned in 2022. I don't know what happened to 2021. They apparently didn't do it in 2021. But then this year, now that it's fully paved and open to the public, they're inviting people to come out and help paint this year's mural. So the murals stay up and along the trail. And so the idea is to add another mural along the trail every year for the next five years. And this year, they're inviting the public to participate and it's kind of going to be like a a color by number situation so you can go and help paint and then there's going to be you know food vendors and local businesses and nonprofits and stuff um that you can you know meet and chat with and that's saturday all day nine to four along sand creek in central park and it's free to participate oh that sounds so fun yeah olivia what grabs you about that one i think just getting to paint in the mural and especially like that it's already kind of laid out for you. Yeah. You yeah. don't have to have any real artistic ability. Yeah. You can just go. I think it'd be so cool because then you're taking a walk on that and you're like, Look, this was the chunk that I painted. Yeah, exactly. I painted that part. That's so cool. Love that. That sounds amazing. I, I lo- That's going to be tough to beat. Uh, but yeah. Peyton, what's our, what's our last option? So your last option is Hunger Free 303. That's an annual music festival that's happening um, in South Gaylord. Well, on the historic South Gaylord Street in Wash Park, that's taking place Saturday, 1 to 10 p.m., and it's hosted by nonprofit Making an Impact. Um, So it's free to attend the music festival, but then um, food and drink tickets for sale, all of those Mm. proceeds go to benefit Making an Impact, which is fighting childhood hunger here in Denver. There's live music and a silent auction, and then... um, you can visit, eat, and drink uh, at all of the businesses along South Gaylord. That sounds Dang. cool, too. Mm-hmm. And nice and close and uh, potentially free unless you want to help out a good cause. Wow, that's a great... That's, yeah. So it's it's Hispanic Heritage kicks off at the Stanley. Mm-hmm. It's the Mile High Flea Market plus Michelada Fest. Then this very cool mural festival on the Sand Creek Greenway. Um, and then finally, a uh, nonprofit fundraiser, Hunger Free 303 Music Festival on Historic Gaylord. I'm not going to lie. I think all of these sound yes, they all really sound cool. So I was excited to, to share these ones and see what you guys thought because uh, I think they sound so fun. I'm so torn. Dang. I'm so torn, I think, between Michelada Fest I and know. the Mural Festival. That's exactly where I'm at, Paul, because I love mm. I love flea markets. I love thrifting. I love antiquing. And I haven't been to a flea market here yet. So, like, uh, especially hearing you, like, talk about going to it in your childhood. Oh, yeah. And there's a oh. Ferris wheel. And it's, like, well, so, ch- it's so fun. Yeah. yeah. There's a Ferris wheel there. It's such a fun, family-friendly thing yeah. to do. It's oh, really it's grabbing me. 
I can't believe we have to vote for only one of these because the Greenway thing, like, be a part of a mural that's going to be up uh, on this bike trail. I will say, oh, Mile High Flea sounds... Market happens every Saturday, and Sand Creek Mural Festival only happens once a year. Uh, well, so sold. Maybe... Yeah. I'm convinced. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think I'll make my own Michelada. <laughs> I'll bring and it. take it with you. Yeah, take it in your hydro flask. <laughs> All right. And okay. there you have it. That's the official CityCast Denver maybe for your weekend, the Sand Creek Mural Festival. Uh, but there's way more where that came from. Payne's got plenty more recommendations in our newsletter, Hey Denver, which you can subscribe to right now at denver.citycast.fm. Peyton, Olivia, thanks so much for joining me today. Yeah, this was a blast. It's great. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. If you enjoyed the show, why not take a minute to tell the director of the Colorado Tourism Office, Tim Wolf, about us. Rate the show wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to our morning newsletter and learn more about us at denver.citycast.fm. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. See you then. Oh, oh, Paul, I meant to say, you watched the menu, didn't you? I couldn't stop thinking about it as I read all of the Michelin star stuff. It, I, now I feel like I need to rewatch that with all of this stuff in mind.